We'll be beginning our study this evening in Matthew chapter 2, the rising of the star, not just dealing with the celestial event, but also dealing with the coming of the Savior whom the star represents. In Matthew chapter 2, we find the an encounter of the wise men coming to Jerusalem and then on to Bethlehem. And in these verses, we read the, these words, the first two verses. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So the star that the wise men saw is what we're going to begin discussing this evening, but then we're going to be broadening it out, and I'll explain the basis of that broadening of the study as we look through what we've just read over. We first of all need to remind ourselves who the wise men were. The wise men were from a highly educated order in their day. They were basically astronomers, astrologers, scientists in general, and considered magicians as well because they had knowledge of certain things and he could put on a pretty good show apparently. They tended to serve under kings but were not themselves royalty. And of course we have an example of them in the book of Daniel as Daniel was numbered as one of the wise men during that time. But these particular wise men that show up in Jerusalem are individuals who had certain knowledge of biblical prophecy. They ask for the one who has been born king of the Jews, and they say, we have seen his star. And this is something that is, makes it obvious that they had certain knowledge of Scripture and were expecting this event and had been perhaps for quite some time. But to clarify, Scripture does not say how many of them there were or how they traveled. Camels are not mentioned in Scripture in reference to the wise men. I know that's shocking. And for tradition's sake, they had to have come on camels, but uh, that's not necessarily how it occurred. We don't really know. But the fact of the matter is they say they saw his star. They saw the king's star. His is referring to the king of the Jews. And you notice as I gave the reading uh, from the ESV, it says when it rose rather than in the east. Now, both of those are acceptable translations of the word in question. I'll explain that to you in just a moment. But I believe that when it rose is a better translation in this particular case. It comes from the Greek word anatole, which literally means rising as in reference to a sunrise or the dawn. And so then east is not the actual meaning, but is rather a derived meaning for this term based on the direction of sunrise. It's kind of universal, so east comes to have that orientation or that uh, relationship to this word, though the word does not in itself mean the east. A little background here, again coming to the wise men and why this interest. It was generally believed during this time, not only by the wise men, but in civilization in general, that stars announced the birth of kings. Now, you remember I said that the wise men were astrologers and astronomers. Back in the day, there was a complete overlap in the two terms. Today, we make a very substantial differentiation between the two. That was not the case at this juncture in history. But They understood that, or they thought there was some sort of correlation between the birth of important individuals, especially kings, and the appearances of certain, shall we say, signs in the heavens among the stars. The word star itself referred to any heavenly orb, whether star, planet, comet, meteor. So it doesn't have to be that it was exactly a star in the scientific definition of that term, that these wise men were seeing in order for this passage to be accurate. It is referring to things as they were understood in that time. And so I would say that we do not know the exact nature of this star. 
Some have suggested it was some sort of comet or a meteor or something of this nature. It may well have been, but one thing we know, it was of divine appointment. However, that exact description may be, and who knows, maybe one day we'll find out exactly what it was. We won't know everything, but we're also acquainted with the fact in verse 9 of our text here in Matthew chapter 2 that the star went before the wise men until it came to rest over the place where the child was. That's the only point during this narrative that we have an idea of this star moving or indicating direction. We do not have that from the outset of the story. So to put it this way, we do not know whether the star moved or gave simply to, to guide them throughout the trip so that every day or every night they were looking for the star. It may have just stayed in the general direction of Israel. They already knew it was the king of the Jews. So they didn't really need to know more than that directional pointer of Israel, though they probably knew that without the benefit of the star, but the star announced the time to begin the trip. Here's another question. Was the star visible during the entire trip? We don't know that either. The passage doesn't say one way or another. It says they saw the star and then they began the trip and then... We're informed in verse 10 of Matthew chapter 2 that when they saw the star, and I put in parenthesis, again. In other words, it was not visible to them for at least a short period of time, but maybe a longer period of time. But now that they see the star again, they're filled with great joy. All that to say that many assumptions are made regarding the star and regarding the nature of the wise men's travel, and a lot of this is... Pure speculation coming from just simply guesses. Uh, we're just simply given a very simplistic narrative that is very bare bones as far as details are concerned. But the more important question is how did they know to watch for a star? How did they know that a star would be an important event? And we'll get to the passage that is the background of this in the Old Testament, but for a moment, we understand that from what we can gather from scriptures, they likely came from the direction of Persia. They, they likely came from that way. That's where the wise men generally were from, from uh, old ancient times. Of course, Daniel was a wise man. He was in Babylon, which would have been considered the north of Israel rather than the east. But you remember then during the latter years of Daniel's time there in Babylon that the Persian Empire came and took over the Babylonian Empire. It was the Medo-Persian Empire at the outset, and it was the Mede, Darius, who was one of the first regents in the area. But very quickly, Persia would overtake the entirety of the empire. And so Daniel seems to be a likely source of the information that these men were following the reason why they knew to look for this star. But if you look at the background in Scripture, it's not exactly a clear-cut case. We come to Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, where, if you recall, Balaam is being compelled, is being encouraged, is being paid by Balak, king of Moab, to curse the nation of Israel. And in the midst of this supposed curse that ends up being a blessing, Balaam, I don't even know how you can call him a prophet of God, but Scripture does call him that. Uh, he is a man that has very mixed motives. But he says these words, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. So here you have a prophecy in the Old Testament that talks about a star that is in reference to the messianic promises of the Old Testament. In fact, this is a messianic text. But we understand from what is said, because of this is contained in prophecy, that the star is a divine provision. 
for two reasons, basically, we'll state that. First, because through divine revelation, this is given in a prophecy that God gives to Balaam. And I would say that the prophecy comes against Balaam's will. The God overrules. Because Balaam had other alternate, all other motives. But it's also true that this divine provision is coming through divine revelation in the birth of Christ. We have here in Matthew chapter 2 the evidence that these wise men followed up on this prophecy. This is the only prophecy in the Old Testament that has to do with this star. But we also understand from this text that the star is a person, it is referred to with very definite personal pronouns, him giving us the idea that it is a person, not just a star in the celestial sense. The star is also a ruler. We're told that the scepter will rise, and it is synonymous with this star, this uh, indication that there is a person that is a ruler, and that ruler is also a conqueror, said to crush Moab and defeat the sons of Sheth. Sheth is another, revel, another reference to Moab. It's not Seth. It is Sheth. And it is a reference again to Moab. Another way in which people say that that could be taken is the sons of confusion. Speaking perhaps of the origin of the nation of Moab. Speaking perhaps of the religious confusion that was Moab. But the star is a conqueror. But the star is also used in the sense of a herald of the Messiah. It is a reference to the Messiah and is, in the same sense, a herald or an announcer of the Messiah. John Gill, a pastor in London from way back, I think the 1800s, latter part of the 1800s, was also a commentator on Scripture. He has commentary that runs the entire length and breadth of Scripture. And he says that his study leads him to this conclusion that it would be equally well to take this passage this way. When a star steers its course from Jacob, then a scepter bearer shall rise out of Israel. That's an interesting take on this prophecy and a reputable way to look at it. But that phrase, shall rise, that he has there, you saw the word, the scepter shall rise out of Israel, is it runs a direct parallel to Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. You remember, in verse 2, we looked at this star. We followed the star when it rose. You remember that translation that was offered. And it is not only the noun anatole, which is the rising or the sunrise, but also a related verb, which we find throughout the Septuagint in several of these passages that we're going to be looking at next, and as well find in some of the New Testament passages, anatello, which uh, is the verb form of to rise. So that is really the basis on which I'm making some of the comparisons Let's go to one other New Testament passage at this point, though, and that is from Luke chapter 1, verses 76 to 79. This is a statement made in Scripture, and you, child, speaking of John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise, Anatole is the word there, shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. So there we have the reference to the sunrise or the day spring you might see before you. Day spring or sunrise translates again that noun, Anatole, which we saw in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2. This rising, it is the same word that we saw there. Now, we know that this word, this day spring, this rising that is spoken of here in reference to a prophecy given over John the Baptist by his father Zechariah, but in reference to the Messiah, 
We know that Jesus Christ is the light sent by God to illuminate the world. We'll look at several passages in several of these uh, connections that deal with Christ as this light. John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Christ himself claims to be the light of the world. In reference to that, Scripture speaks of Jesus Christ as being the bringer of the new day of grace. Here's a passage, of course, in John chapter 1 that tells us that Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. That's verse 14. Verse 17 says that grace and truth came through Jesus. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So I have a question for you. Was there any grace before Jesus came? Roger's shaking his head yes. Of course there was. So what's this verse saying? It's saying that Jesus is the full expression of the grace of God. Going back to verse 14, he is full of grace and truth. His is the fullness of grace and truth. And so when we see in John 1.17 that grace and truth came through Christ, what it's saying is that the fullest expression of God's grace and of God's truth came directly through the person of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Hebrews chapter 1 is telling us. You remember how Hebrews 1, 1 starts out. God, who at many times and in many ways spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days done what? Spoken unto us in the Son, the fullest revelation. And then there is the comparison throughout Hebrews 1 and 2 of the superiority of Christ to any revelation that preceded him. And we wouldn't argue that point. We understand fully that that's exactly the truth. And so the description that I give here of Jesus Christ being the bringer of the new day of grace is exactly in keeping with what we're seeing here in these passages. But back to Luke chapter 1, verse 78, 79, it says that this day spring, this sunrise, visited us from on high. I find that phrasing unique. Visited, giving the idea of pre-existence. We know that Jesus came to earth from heaven. Now, I know there are those parents who tell their kids that before they were born, they were in in one of God's angels, but that's just a bunch of hooey. It's not true. Scripture says nothing of the sort. We didn't have a preexistence in heaven, but Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ not only was yeah, said to come directly from uh, heaven to earth. John 1, verse 1, he was in the beginning with God, this face-to-face relationship. Verse 14, this word was made flesh. But we're also told in the announcement by the angels of Jesus Christ's arrival, they say, glory to God in the highest. Interesting to note that the word there in, he, in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 78, from on high, And the word here in Luke 2, verse 14, in the highest are related Greek words, high and highest, both referring to the presence of God, both referring to heaven itself. Back to Luke 1, 78 and 79, this day spring, this sunrise who is Jesus Christ, gave light to those sitting in darkness. This is interesting because the related passage, and we'll look at it in just a moment, from the Old Testament talks about the people walking in darkness, and yet the quote in the New Testament is sitting in darkness. A reminder once again that the vast majority of the Old Testament quotes found in the New Testament are quoted from the Septuagint rather than the Hebrew because it's what people were more familiar with. It was the Greek translation. And so there are differences in wording, and yet God's Holy Spirit uses the differences in wording for his own purposes coming into the New Testament. Well, here, this sitting in darkness is the idea that they're captivated, that they are controlled, 
by darkness. And let me suggest something regarding our approach, our thought process regarding evil. Most people think that evil is a force outside themselves. Few realize that it is a force active within themselves. Have you ever heard the question or asked the question, why in the world did Adam eat the fruit? Well, let me just tell you that every one of us would have done the same thing. Not a one of us would have chosen anything different. In fact, we like to think of ourselves as better than individuals of historic ignominy, individuals who have done terrible things. You know that if we were in the same situation of, let's just say, Nazi Germany, that we would have done some of the same things that people of that day did, apart from the grace of Jesus Christ. It is within us to do the same sorts of evil that individuals have done that we look at today and just are flabbergasted. I can't believe people would do something like that. Let's put the case a little bit more to the point, maybe. If Jesus Christ were to come to earth during our lifetime in the first advent, which, of course, that can't happen because it already did, Apart from the grace of God, everyone around us and we ourselves would be yelling, crucify him. That's the evil that dwells within us. And we haven't yet, not all of us have given full expression to it. And those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior have surrendered ourselves to the other principle of God's grace. But apart from that grace, there is no atrocity from the past or coming in the future that we could not have participated in. That's the nature of the evil within us. Let's look at a couple passages in Isaiah real quickly. Isaiah chapter 9, starting at verse 1, says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he, made glory, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. So you see the same kind of idea of this light rising, this light shining on individuals. Galilee is being described here. And we remember from... What we just looked at in the New Testament, that that is applied during the lifetime of Jesus Christ, that he is that light that brought great clarity to Galilee. The people of Galilee then were steeped in darkness. Now, Galilee refers to the area occupied by the northern ten tribes of Israel. This isn't pagan country. But remember that very early in their existence from their first king, Jeroboam, they adopted the golden calf idolatry, and that set the tone for everything that followed in their history. In fact, idolatry from many different nations infected the area. You remember Ahab imports the cult of Baal from nations to the north. And in fact, if you went to the area of Galilee even today, you will find ruins of all sorts of pagan temples and altars. It's the fact that this area became overrun by idolatry. It became known as Galilee of the nations or Galilee of the Gentiles or Galilee of the heathen or the pagan. So much as to say that the nation of Israel just sort of had the idea, not only Nazareth, but all of Galilee, can any good come of Galilee? So it's interesting that Christ takes up his dwelling there. But our passage tells us in Isaiah chapter 9 that great light shone to dispel the deep darkness. It's interesting the contrasts that Scripture presents in wording here. The darkness we're talking about is the darkness of sin, and it's described in Scripture, sin is, as a desperate and a hostile evil that damns souls eternally. 
I want us to understand that evil is not passive. Evil is not just simply out there. Evil is something inward, and evil is something active and hostile against God. Our natures are hostile against God. We looked at that this morning from Romans chapter 8. That's how the description here in Isaiah 9 is phrased as well. These people are walking in darkness. It's not just an absence of light. It is a willful rejection of light. And it's only the light of the Son of God who can dispel this darkness. John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 says of Jesus that in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see, when Jesus was coming into the world, he was dispelling darkness by his very presence. It was a great darkness, and it required great light to get rid of that. And in that context, just prior to these verses in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we're acquainted with the fact that it is Jesus who is the creator. He is the one who said, let there be light. He is the one who first brought light into the universe. And then he comes again as the bearer of light into our human existence. Back to, in our minds at least, to Luke chapter 1, verses 78 and 79, there was this prophecy that Jesus is to be this light. In his ministry in Galilee, as described in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 16, is the special fulfillment of that promise that Jesus settling in Galilee. If you look there in Matthew chapter 4, you'll see that it references the Isaiah chapter 9 prophecy that this great darkness is overcome by great light. But another passage in Isaiah also has to do with this light and the shining, the rising of the light. And that's Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising." Here it is, the glory of the Lord, the glory of Yahweh that has risen upon the people. But if you noted in the reading here uh, earlier in the text, darkness was covering the entire earth, not just Galilee. The darkness of Isaiah 9 is in specific reference to the northern part of Israel, but here it is much more pervasive than the darkness described in chapter 9. It's described as intense darkness, great darkness, gross, thick darkness, covering the nations. And think about this. As Israel was a reflection of the light of God's glory by having revelation given to them throughout the Old Testament time frame, It would be very true that the farther you went away from that epicenter of brightness, it would grow increasingly dark. To the point, if you were from another nation, you would not have the light of truth. I'm not talking about physical darkness. I'm talking about a spiritual darkness. And that's why Scripture makes it very clear that the nation of Israel is not to imitate any of the religious practices of the nations around them because all they have is darkness. Can you think for a moment of what the areas of the world were like from which many of us come by way of our ancestors? What kind of paganism surrounds things like Stonehenge? What kind of paganism, even the pyramids in Egypt? And you can go around the world and find all of these different monuments to mankind's superstitious and idolatrous past, and you see something of the darkness 
many of these cultures even including human sacrifice. And yet, it is God himself, it is Yahweh who will rise upon Israel to give light not only to this nation, but also to the nations of the world. And again, we see that same motif that we've been following, that rising of light. Within this text, we also saw the admonition at the beginning of verse 1 and then following down in several verses uh, toward the end of the text, that the people of God are supposed to radiate the light that God gives, the light of revelation, the light of truth. And the the net effect of that is to be that the pagan world will be drawn to the light, the curiosity to see truth being lived out, to hear truth. And Scripture says that kings will come to the brightness of God's people. Now, understand that this is a prophetic text, not just a historic text. We're talking in some senses of the millennium that's yet to come, when the true light of truth will dawn on the people of God in Israel and radiate out out from that, to the point that people of the world will be grabbing a hold of Jews rather than to persecute them to say, let us follow you to worship your God. You have truth, and we do not. And the passage says that even kings of the world will rise to come to that brightness. So we understand that Christ's first advent begins the revelation of this light. He is the light sent by the Father into the world. But it is actually in the second advent of Jesus Christ that the full fulfillment of this prophecy has its day. We come to one other passage, though, in the book of Malachi, the rise of the sun of righteousness. Notice the words of Malachi 4, verse 2, But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. We understand not only from this text, but following the meaning of Scripture, that Jesus is the sun of righteousness. In other words, he is the zenith of God's righteousness. He is the Yahweh Tzidkenu of Jeremiah 23, 6, the Lord, our righteousness. And that's revealed in several passages in the New Testament. We have Romans chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, which says that the righteousness of God apart from the law is manifest in faith in Jesus Christ. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says this, But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Notice that phrasing, that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. He is the zenith of the revelation of God's righteousness, and he rises to benefit those who fear God. That's what our text says there, for those who fear your name, fear his, God's name. And it also is stated that he provides healing. Now, this is not just talking about physical healing, but we can see in Christ's first advent the effects of physical healing, and they're going to be even more pronounced in his second advent, that is, after the Battle of Armageddon. There he's dealing death and destruction. But after that, as the mop-up occurs and his kingdom on earth is established, There is physical healing, there is social healing, there is spiritual healing, there is interpersonal or relationship healing. And in Christ right now, we can experience this healing as well. As relationships are set right, as our character becomes transformed by our relationship to Jesus Christ. And Scripture reveals both Old Testament and New, that one day Jesus will be the only light there is. Consider these texts. First of all, Isaiah 60, verses 19 and 20, 19 through 21. The sun shall no more be your light by day. This, of course, is referring to the eternal day. 
nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. What an amazing statement. Now, it's echoed in the New Testament. We'll get to that in just a few moments. But let's summarize what we're seeing here. We're finding that the sun and the moon don't have their normal roles. In fact, they're gone. And that instead, in their place, we have Yahweh. We have, you notice it said Lord, all caps, who will be himself our light. He will be our everlasting light. And all of his people will be righteous. Those are good promises. Now let's look at them, the same promises in New Testament text. Revelation 21, 23. The city, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the Lamb. Revelation 22, 5. And night shall be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So once again, we're seeing that this eternal city of God needs no sun or moon. These things have passed out of need, necessity. It is rather the glory of God in the person of the Lamb of God who is the light of this city. As a result, night will be no more. You don't need a moon. Jesus Christ himself will be the light. The Lord God will be our light forever, is the statement of Scripture. And the light is the Lamb, as we read just a few moments ago. And then there's one other New Testament text, also from Revelation 22, which tells us that Jesus Christ will be our eternal bright morning star. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. When that dawn happens, when that star rises, there will no longer be a sunset. Jesus Christ will be our eternal light. So, There's great significance in this idea of a star that the wise men are following, but beyond it to what Scripture tells us is coming in the future. There is yet coming a day when our Lord will rise. He will be seen as exalted, and he will be worshipped throughout the entirety of the universe. His coming in the Manger was simply the foretaste of the coming blessing. I trust we'll worship him as a result of what we're seeing here this evening. Let's pray. Father, guide us in our continued meditation on your word. Things have been suggested to us that could occupy our minds for many hours. May we meditate on your word and allow these passages to have their full impact upon us. That we would appreciate our Savior for who he is and who he will yet be revealed to be. May we not just worship the Christ child who actually does not exist. But may we worship the transcendent Christ who fills all things and who will one day replace even the sun and the moon and shine with brightness to illuminate every corner of God's celestial universe. Lord, we thank you for the part that we're going to play in this and witnessing it. Help us to worship you in the meanwhile as we prepare for that day in Jesus' name. Amen. Rain, would you come, please?